um, uh, Jilla, uh, who is going to tell us uh, all about, I mean, he really, what does he do? Uh, zero quarter, I'd say June does the best, most precise measurements available. Uh, builds great clocks, does cool um, quantum simulation experiments uh, in optical lattices. And today he's going to tell us about all sorts of stuff uh, about measurement of the quantum frontier. Well, thank you. Uh, so I was just told that we have 80% of the audience are theorists who likes to see equations. If that's the case, I'm going to disappoint you. Uh, so, but it, it, on the other hand, I feel this is a great opportunity to introduce to you some of the language that we AMO physicists use. I think it, it's sometime down the road in your scientific career, you're going to be if, even if you are a theorist, you're going to end up working with some experimentalists. Uh, and it's being able to connect, being able to use the language. Why, when you say, well, qubit is going to be 99.99% um, fidelity when you can do the pi pulse or do the, uh, the gate operations, it's useful to know what they actually do in the laboratory. So this, my hope is to give you, this, this is the last week of your time here in summer school, give you some tool of the AMO uh, techniques that we use in the laboratory to prepare quantum states, how I see as a perspective of quantum information processing and precision measurements. As a physicist, we know that everything's based on measurement. Um, in fact, including building quantum computers. So when you build a quantum computer, you, and if I give you a computer, you said, this can do calculations, the first thing come to your mind would be, how do I verify the calculations making sense, right? So it's all based on quantum measurement, quantum information processing are, are the same thing. And I would, from that perspective, I want to give you the talk on quantum measurement. Um, excuse me, let me connect this up. And uh, because I think there are tremendous amount of opportunities between AMO physics and quantum science, and the, the role of quantum information has, in fact, been quite important of giving us a lot of inspirations of thinking about measurement problems for quantum science in a, in a new light uh, b based on the, the understanding of how systems can become entangled and so on. So, so this is really the perspective I want to come from, you know, telling you that something is not showing for some reason. Hopefully, we'll come back up. Yeah, so a simple system like this. You can think of it as your qubits here. Eventually, you can think of this as a, a quantum system or quantum resource. You're going to be able to do quantum computing. And, and it, we have lasers to prepare quantum states, manipulate how the atoms can interact with each other, how they evolve, and in the end, as a physicist, there are actually tremendous of opportunities right now lying in front of us to probe both fundamental physics in the deepest insight that we can have, and also look, using that system to look for emerging phenomena with you know, atomic clock as an example that I'm going to give you. And, and in, during my talk, I will tell you a little bit of a quantum simulation where how do you use this very precise quantum state engineering to study many body Hamiltonians and use this to do tabletop search for new physics beyond the standard model, and so on. A search for, even search for dark matter I will cover uh, very, very briefly. But so with this uh, in, in your mind, here's my lecture outline. Uh, the first lecture today, I'm going to give you some pictures of a simple atomic physics so, we, so that we can communicate. If nothing else, coming out of the, my lectures, should it make you feel like you're prepared to discuss atomic physics with some atomic physicist? And that would be great if we can achieve that goal. Some very basic quantum physics. I know you are probably a lot more sophisticated uh, than those basic physics ideas I'm going to tell you. But at least what I would like to is you are very sophisticated in, in your way of thinking about theory problems. How do, they, how do people actually make those measurements based on those theory? Uh, and that's the connection sometimes are not obvious. If I throw you into a laboratory, you see all these cables running around. How does Hamiltonian, you know, uh, this annihilation operator turns into something you actually measure, a photon or, or a quantum state of an atom? 
And, and this is really the goal that gave you some of the language that how we do things, what are the tools that we use, what is a basic laser science, we need a laser light to manipulate the qubits uh, if the qubit operate in the optical domain. So this really forms the ingredients for control and the measurement of quantum coherence. And whether this is an optical atomic clock or uh, information processor as a quantum computer, a lot of these ingredients, basic ingredients, are the same for as experimental control toolbox. Based on this, I will give you uh, the second lecture too tomorrow, and uh, what we'll introduce how the atoms can interact with each other, and uh, how that becomes a problem for the measurement science because when they interact with each other, if you don't control, it will introduce measurement uncertainties in your system. On the other hand, you can view this as an opportunity to actually study many body quantum systems. And if you can do very precise measurements and you can control how the atoms come in to, to interact with each other, you can, in principle, from the first principle to understand the emergence of complexity. And this is a, a very exciting area of where quantum information science, condensed matter physics, atomic physics, molecular physics can come together and um, uh, play a really important role of discovery for, for new phenomena. So this is something that I will tell you tomorrow. The third lecture, I thought, also since we are one of the best places of controlling molecules, now we are getting to the place where a degenerate gas of molecules is just being made, actually as of last month, uh, and we can load now into a three-dimensional lattice with very, very low entropy quantum gas of molecules. And this, I will tell you a bit of how we can make those molecules and why they are now turning into a new playground for quantum physics and chemistry. Maybe chemistry is something far off from your mind. But remember, as you build a quantum computer, one of the key, uh, key applications would be the quantum chemistry that you're going to study. And here's uh, some opportunities where you, where you can actually build these experiments from scratch in your laboratory and actually study these uh, entanglements, propagation, how the, how the entanglement, collective quantum physics affect the the, how the traditional view of, a, of a physical chemistry and so on. So let's go on to talk about big pictures. You know, if we want to build, a quant use, use quantum mechanics to build the, mo the best measurement device that we want to have, some of the lofty goals of probing fundamental physics included understanding of the universe, for example, why uh, there are uh, there are dark matters that we know exist in the universe uh, because the, we know from astrophysical observations there are planets or the galaxies which are spiraling out in, in, a, in, a, in a galaxy, uh, a star that supposed to be with the velocity going down as you go further away, but yet they maintain constant velocity. So there's something un unforeseen here, that, that so-called dark matter. Can we build man-made device, instead of relying on astrophysical observation, can we actually build devices that to probe this type of fundamental physics that we haven't been able to probe so far? We, have heard, we, we cannot detect gravitational waves, and you have all heard about LIGO, except maybe in the LIGO detection, you're only hearing the very tail end of when the two black holes merging onto each other, and you hear this little blip of the gravitational wave. If you can build a device, such as the atomic clock, um, maybe you can, you can probe those gravitational wave ripple as a function of time over a long period of time. Uh, you will really be able to follow gravitational wave, even to a point eventually being able to follow the stochastic noise of, of, of gravity in, in the universe. So in order to be able to do this, kind of a forefront of a fundamental physics, we needed to build, be able to build atomic clocks at the level of 10 to minus 21 and beyond. These are incredibly good numbers that we cannot reach yet. Uh, but if you were able to build atomic clocks at the level of, say, measure, being able to measure time with a precision of 10 to minus 21, and you can build a network of those clocks, then suddenly this opens up a tremendous opportunity that will allow you to see when, the, when our solar system is going through the universe, whether we are going through chunks of the dark matter and it will have effect on your atomic clock. Distant galaxy can explode, and, and, um, and you no longer needed to measure interferometry based on, on the Earth, where you measure the distance between the two interferometers, how they are changing when the space-time fabric is, 
is a shear that parted to gravitational waves, you can actually directly put clocks in the middle of the gravitational wave, and here the time is being changed due to the gravitational wave, right? In fact, if you want to build a network like a clock like this, quantum communication will become a key part of the technology. How do, are you going to share information between these satellites, and how do you keep such accurate clocks together, synchronized together, and this is a part of the technology of communication and quantum communication and so on. So we set ourselves a very lofty goal, and my goal is to be able to tell you in the next two lectures, to tell you this is not a far-fetched 10 to minus 21. In fact, this is something, as we start to build a quantum computer, I would argue we are also using that technology starting to build atomic clocks that will allow us to get to this regime where you can probe very interesting fundamental physics uh, that are un unexplored at the moment. Yeah, please, ask, uh, ask your questions. Where are we right now? Uh, I'm going to answer that question in the, if you don't mind. Uh, we are two orders, three orders magnitude below it. So it's not that far-fetched, but it, I will tell you some of the technology that's coming along, why, we, why I think in the next 20 years, by the time you are professors, we may be able to get into that regime. <laughs> well, everybody has different pace of get becoming a professor, so that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> so it, with such a lofty goal, uh, let's talk about time scales, because this is a very much in the story of quantum coherence. Remember, if you want to build a quantum computer, the, the first thing you need is to have quantum coherence. This is your resource, and the best thing you can do is to preserve that quantum coherence for as long as possible. And a, a figure of merit is always, during a finite time where you have a quantum coherence, how many gate operations you can have, right? So in many ways, if having quantum coherence is not a sufficient condition, but it is a necessary condition for anything that's involved for precision measurements to uh, information processing. So here's a picture about coherence, time scales, and so on. And let's talk about something really big. Life, life of the universe is a 15 billion years, so we know from Big Bang, and that's 10 to the 18 seconds. A quantum coherence is resembled by a single atom. And if you have the, the, the electrons moving around the nucleus, you can think of that's a, a little pendulum that's made out of the quantum mechanical uh, end of the project uh, of the of the product, uh, and that has a evolution time scale on the order of 10 to the minus 15 second. People call that a femtosecond. This describes how fast the electron moves on the nucleus. These time scales are very different. One describes a very microscopic end of things. Things. This one is a very macroscopic time scale uh, that governing the whole universe. The product of which the geometrical mean of that is 30 seconds. And the reason why I always like to make this analogy is if you can pick an atomic system, uh, for example, in, in the case that I'm going to tell you about is a strontium atom, for a particular pair of energy level states that you can prepare quantum coherence between these two energy, uh, uh, energy levels wh where the coherence can last for uh, several minutes. That means that this qu quality factor during the several minutes of a co quantum coherence the evolution, the orbital evolution is happening at a time scale of 10 to the minus 15 second. This is so-called a quality factor. That means that during this lifetime of you establish this quantum coherence, the quantum pendulum is swinging 10 to the 17 times without decay. Okay, that's the highest Q you probably have heard of. Yes? How do you measure such the years? Yeah, uh, excellent question, and in fact, I hope by the end of the lecture, you will know exactly what we do in the lab. We don't have 160 seconds right now, but we are getting close to 60 seconds of coherence time in the lab, which is kind of amazing thing if you think about, you prepare atom in a coherent superposition in a quantum state, and, you, you, and then you leave the room and take a coffee break and come back, it's still co quantum mechanically coherent. This is, a, this is a, what's the, uh, the very forefront of a measurement science we have right now. Um, and the, the reason I introduced this number is that you can see this is a nice bridge, the middle point from the geometrical uh, sort of the, uh, logarithmic time scales. On one hand, 160 seconds through this quality factor allow you to access very microscopic end of how things evolve in the quantum mechanics world. On the other hand, it's at the same sort of a ratio going 
going to govern the whole universe, the time scale of how the universe actually uh, evolves. So if you can really span that level of a precision, that means you could possibly connect quantum mechanics with gravity. That would be a really big goal. And, and I think it all comes from the fact that how do we do that quantum coherence? That's the whole goal of my lecture number one. The, the question you're asking is the essential point that I want to be able to clearly convey how we do this in the laboratory. You, yes? That's a, uh, calculated number? That's a measured number. That's a measured number. Yeah. There will be several ways we are going to get to the point uh, for that 160 second. Uh, not directly, but it is actually is measured through perturbation theory and so on. Directly, we can measure now something on the order of 20 seconds, or 60 seconds on that scale. That's still uh, quite amazing, that meaning that during that coherent superposition, you can have this quantum pendulum oscillating for not 10 to 17 times, but 10 to the 16 times. That's still quite a, quite a lot of evolution that's happening. Is a question over there? No. <coughs> so so we are all experts on quantum mechanics. So this, this may sound sounds really trivial to you. Uh, but it's, it's important. Let's put some trivial facts down first. Uh, quantum uncertainty and certainty. You know, the reason why we build clock based on atoms is because of quantum certainty principle, which is when you are describing how electrons are moving around nucleus, there are energy level structures you, lo you learn, right? And these are so-called quantized eigenvalues of a Hamiltonian, of a single atom Hamiltonian. And these states are absolutely fixed. The, the, the measurement between these two energy level structures, uh, if you want to measure the energy difference between those two, would it be a fixed constant of nature that no matter where you measure, take, make that measurement, it's always the same. And if you put a population all in the ground state or everything in the excited state, that population is very much determined. There's no noise. And this is the, the certain aspect of quantum mechanics. But the uncertainty principle, of course, is a, plays an essential role. And in, in fact, one can argue uncertainty principle is the only essential role of quantum mechanics that governs everything, including entanglement later on. When you're putting an atom in a coherent superposition between ground and excited state, now in this particular state, this is no longer an argon state of the Hamiltonian. And so when you make a measurement, you will be collapsing this mechanic, quantum mechanical superposition into either ground state or excited state. But when you put this into coherent superposition, if you don't disturb it, it's going to evolve according to the Hamiltonian energy difference between your excited and ground state. But when you try to make a measurement, there's a measurement noise that's associated with this little blob of no quantum noise that, uh, due to the fact that, 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 that uh, your measurement itself will collapse the wave function into either G or E state. Okay, so this is, you can think of this as a pseudo spin half system. Sometimes people talk about spin half Hamiltonians. This is a part of the sp uh, spin half Hamiltonian where the spin half is not real spin, but rather just two level systems of atomic uh, states. And this is where the quantum uncertainty principle comes in. So in order to make very precise measurements of the evolution of this, this eigenstate, this coherent superposition between ground and excited state, uh, remember, there's a phase factor that, that's given by the energy separation between the two states. And this evolution can be measured by a very precise laser. That's the quantum coherence. And the laser is trying to measure that quantum coherence. How well you can do that measurement, it turns out each particle, each atom, provides this, this one unit of a measurement uncertainty. So if you measure over many, many atoms, the noise will scale down as a one over square root of how many atoms you were able to measure. And this is so-called a standard quantum limit of the how well you can measure the evolution of the atomic states is given by how many copies of atoms you can make that precise measurement given the same amount of coherence time you have. So from here, it's very clear. The more particle numbers you have, the better. If you treat these in individual atoms as completely separated, that, that each one of them has a one unit of a quantum noise, then indeed the quantum noise averages a one over square root of n. But you probably have heard about entangled states and spin squeezed states and so on. What that means is that the noise of these in individual atoms, th these blob, if you in indicate this as a quantum noise, they will become entangled or they will become correlated such that the quantum noise will actually be distorted to a point that you can actually have noise below one over square root 
loop the end. And this is really the powerfulness of entanglement, uh, uh, of qu quantum entanglement will come in later in your measurement precision. This is all clear, yes? So this, uh, immediately th uh, this comes to a very good recipe of uh, so-called how, how do you go to the laboratory and make a very precise measurements. Everything can come down to basically doing spectro good spectroscopy work. And you can see that there are three ingredients. If you are searching for a particular physical effect, you want to look for <coughs> a particular parameter that has the strongest dependence on that physical effect because that gives you the separation between left and the right and left and right and you can make a differential measurements to tease out that physical effect, it, what that physical effect is. But the counting statistics will be given by how many atoms you were able to get to count. The more you get to count, the more precise you can determine the center of these peaks, therefore the separation of these peaks. So large counting statistics is important. This is the square root of n thing that I was talking about. Long coherence time is important because the longer the coherence time in this frequency domain, meaning narrower spectroscopy line shape, so that you can better separate these lines in, in a spectroscopy kind of a signature. And so all together you can see that how well you can do a perform a measurement. And this is, doesn't have to be a clock. Any physical measurements that you want to do in your laboratory, you are always looking for how well you can collect statistics, how long you can make that measurement last in a coherent fashion, and how many times you can repeat it, and uh, what is the most physical effect you're searching for so to maximize the signal to noise ratio, right? It all comes down to this particular equation where omega t is just how many, t is a coherence time, omega t just tells you how many oscillations you can have over that coherence time, how many particles you use to give you the square root of n um, average of the so-called standard quantum limit. If you get into the entanglement, this, the, this limit can be broken. You can do even better. And then it, eventually is how many measurements you have done. Tau is the averaging time divided by t. You can forget about this dark time, td. So tau over t basically tells you how many measurements you repeated. Uh, the longer you're repeating the measurements, as long things are under control, you can continue to accumulate statistics and things get better. So it's a very simple. These are all you need to know in terms of making very precise measurements in the laboratory. But of course, as people always say, devils are in the details. In each term, how do you make a T to be, as, a, as that particular student asked, how do you keep that T to be very long? How many atoms can you can put it in your system? How many times you can average, keep averaging down that system? All of that is the daily life of experimentalists to try to maximize the, the gain of, of this particular measurement system. And for many ways, whether you are building, again, I want to make this emphasis, whether you are building quantum computer or you are building atomic clock, many ways this kind of a technical expert, uh, requirements comes down to be the same. Yeah, Leo? Just a question, so tau is the time to measure? Yeah, tau is the time, like tau could be a day. And if in each day, your, your coherence time, say, is one second, then how many measurements you were able to make in one day is 24 times 36,000, 3,600. And so is this is just, this number is basically the same, playing the same role as a square root of n, right? It's just how many measurements you were able to repeat, either through the ensemble average or through time repeated average, making assumption that, it, that noise is not wandering around. Yeah. And sigma is just effective view. The, the stigma? This sigma is just telling you the, the, the measurement precision. How, what, what's the fractional noise you were able to average down to? Right. It's a dimensionless number. So omega t is the how many, how many, omega t is dimensionless, right? This is how many oscillations you were able to make. And this is the square root of how many particles participated in that measurement, how many measurements you were able to make. And in the end, it's a dimensionless number. But can I think of it like an effective Q? Well, yeah, it's an effective Q. So you have a, well, Omega t really is sort of the, yeah, this is exactly right. So it's a, omega t times n, oh, it, it, omega t is kind of the q factor already. It, it's, you know, omega is a frequency oscillation, t is the total coherence time you have. Yeah, so it's effective q divided by how many times you can measure the effective q. That's all. That's why it's very simple in that sense. Yeah. So, 
So now uh, let's come down to some of the ingredients that we needed to maintain that coherence time. So since the capital T is what we're chasing for. So here's the atom, which is in coherence superposition of ground excited state. That's why the electron distribution looks a little funny. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a ground, it's not a P wave. So it's an S wave and a P wave coherence superposition. And it's going to oscillate. When I start to oscillate, this is a quantum coherence, OK? You can think of this is a quantum coherence. And you can resemble that as a, a quantum pendulum that's oscillating back and forth. And we all know. You know, if we, uh, you have from your daily experience, when you have, say, a stroboscopic light and try to see how when the fans, the electrical fan is turned on and you want to see every single blade what during the time when it's rotating really fast, the only way to do it is put a stroboscopic light such that the frequency of the light is similar to the rotational speed of the fan. You can actually, Chris, you can actually make a very good picture of how the fan is rotating. You probably have all experienced that before. Your laser, this is the white light, this is the white sinusoidal curve, is, you can think of as a stroboscopic light. So the, you put an atom in the coherent superposition. How are we going to read out this atom is, is oscillating back and forth? Well, the way to do this is the is is light. Light is the way we communicate with atoms. So if your light is tuned onto exactly the same oscillation frequency of the atom, you can actually see whether the atom is swinging to the left or to the right. This is, of course, a classical analogy I'm making, but this will give you the basic picture that something that you want to probe, this very long, coherent quantum superposition, you better have a tool that's equally as good. So, so this gives me the, the excuse to tell you a little bit about lasers, because laser is such an important tool. If you're going to go out there to be a, a um, information scientist building quantum computers, even if you don't use lasers, even if you just use superconducting qubits, I just think laser is a good tool to learn about because, uh, because many of the modern technologies are all related. So uh, even if you have not used the lasers before, you can think of this as I'm going to give you just a few slides, a very simple picture of what laser is. If, you, if lasers basically have a gain medium with two, a pair of mirrors where the optical scanning wave can, can be established in between, right? It's a very simple picture. And in fact, laser is now the central ruler for both time because we can build atomic clocks based on our lasers and also space. And that's because laser is a very coherent form of sinusoidal oscillation and of electromagnetic wave. And because of speed of light is in fact the nature, uh, constant of nature. So time, if you can measure time or if you can measure frequency, then through <coughs> the speed of light C, which is a constant of nature, you also have the distance that you can measure. And this is why, the, why laser plays such an important role in the modern science and technology. Um, going back to how to make a very, very stable optical oscillator, as we saw in the animation, that's very important if you want to explore that kind of a quantum coherence. Here's a pair of mirrors forming a so-called fabry pearl cavity. The optical wave is running back and forth. The, these mirrors are very highly reflective. It's like in the morning you get up, if your bathroom has two mirrors before and after, you will see infinite series of your face. This is, a, this is a kind of the photon seeing itself over and over and over. The longer you can stay there, the better, because the coherence time will be longer. But in the end, there will be fluctuations of the length of these mirrors. This is actually one of the cavities we use in the laboratory. And how well you can maintain this sinusoidal wave to be coherent, meaning there's no interruption in the oscillation frequency. Anytime there's a little interruption here that you lose the phase information and the laser is no longer coherent. Right, so you want to have this uninterrupted sinusoidal wave coming out of this cavity. But because the cavity, the, the mirrors are always moving a little bit back and forth, there's a finite time or finite length scale where the, the optical wave will maintain to be uh, phase coherent. And the typical, law, uh, typical number that I'm going to give you is that, say the, cap the distance between the two mirrors is about a meter, and the, the relative distance between the two mirrors are fluctuating at a scale which is a one hundredth or one thousandth of a nuclear size. That's 10 to the minus 16 meters. Then the, there is a fractional fluctu fluctuation of the length. Delta L over L would be 10 to the minus 16. That will dictate how stable the laser frequency is going to be at the level of 10 to minus 16, 10 to minus 17. And this, that's why it's very delicate, because when you have a cavity like this, we all know if somebody knocks on the table or somebody 
enter the room uh, and the door bangs behind him or her, and you have a vibration noise, you walk across the lab, it's very easy to perturb these kind of a mechanical system. And this we, we call it technical noise. If you use a cryostat, the cryostat hums around and it's going to have a lot of vibrational noise. So all of these are problems. You know, when the pressure in the room fluctuates, the index of reflection changes and that can cause the laser phase noise to have, change, have uh, variations. So we can solve many, many of these technical problems. In fact, in the lab, you do a lot of that kind of work, you know, dirty work just to be able to remove those technical noise to get to the fundamental limit. What is the fundamental limit? The fundamental limit turns out to be these are mechanical structures and, and this lecture will now connect to some of the, uh, uh, the for example, Cindy Regal's nanomechanical oscillator. I'm going to make some connection to that. These are the uh, oscillators you can think of made out of mechanical structures. Any mechanical uh, substance, whether it's a mirror substrate or the thin film coating that allow you to have a very, very high reflectivity or the spacer that's supporting the pair of mirrors, they all have complex Young's modulus, right? You all heard of it. it Young's modulus describes how stiff the material is. Quality factor describes how dissipative that material is. If the material is very lossy, the quality factor is very low. If the material is not lossy, the quality factor is very high. And associated with this quality factor of the lossiness of the mechanical structure, that we know that at a finite temperature, KT, there's always thermodynamic energy that's coupling into each individual mechanical mode. And those mechanical modes leads to when they uh, stochastically independent, independently contribute to the th noise, you can add them up in a st statistically independent fashion, and that's where it leads to this length fluctuations. That's fundamental. As long as the temperature T is a finite, no, regardless how stable the temperature T is, as long as it is finite, you will always have finite noise. And this is the, the theorem that Einstein established 100 years ago, so called the dissipation fluctuation theorem. And so that's any loss, you will have a KT worth of energy that's being feed, fed into this, and you will have a fluctuation. And this fluctuation is, gives rise to this finite amount of delta L over L noise. And, and as you can see, scales with square root of the KT worth of any thermal energy uh, divided by how stiff the material is and how quality factor uh, works in your favor when the higher quality factor, meaning you have a lower loss. This is the fundamental limit uh, uh, dictates how lasers are, wh whether lasers are going to be stable, phase coherent, or not. And this thermal noise, if you are interested in s any of the modern technology sort of pushing the, the, the state of our interferometers, the best interferometers, and you may have seen a picture like this. This is in Conrad Leonard's laboratory down the hall, where he uses this little membrane to study quantum mechanical superposition when he puts real macroscopic material like this piece of membrane into a coherent into the the ground state of the vibrational state of quantum mechanically at the in, inside his dilution refrigerator what limits the noise of a, a oscillator like this a macroscopic oscillator what i call it a macroscopic it's a 15 micron scale it's the thermal noise i just described to you earlier in the previous slide um, for the cavity that we use for building the best optical atomic clock, what's limiting the, how stable the laser is? It's the thermal noise that I just described. It's all, for some of you likes to see equation, that's the only equation that I'm showing you. That's the thermal noise limit. But it governs on all the interferometers, and including from this nanomechanical oscillators to the, medi to the medium scale oscillators to very big oscillators like LIGO, what limits the sensitivity of the LIGO, listening to the gravitational waves, incredible time of, uh, we live in an incredible time of excitement, of physics, right? These are the discoveries that's never been made before, and now it's being made. And what's limiting their sensitivity? It's that thermal noise that I showed you earlier. So <coughs> the good thing is that the physics is always allow us to scale in, uh, uh, finding out what's the common factor, and then we can solve the problem. So many scientific communities now are trying to deal with this, this thermal noise issue, and that leads to many insights and a new development. For example, we recently uh, uh, put together a cavity like this made out of a, a pure crystal of silicon, 
and turns out at a particular temperature of uh, like a 124 or, or 17 kelvins, the silic this pure crystal of silicon, the, the the thermal expansion coefficient goes through goes to zero, meaning you have a cavity like this. If you stabilize the temperature at 124 kelvin, it neither expands nor shrinks, so it's very stable, and has a tremendously good Young's modulus and is tremendously good quality factor, so you have essentially pushed the laser stability to as high as you possibly can. And you can build multiple systems like this and bring them together and have uh, compare them. Uh, if you have, and here shows how the optical beats, but the, you can think of these are two sinus, it's like two radio stations emitting waves in the optical domain and you can beat them on top of each other and here's a beat frequency between two lasers with 8 millihertz line width, indicating that actual optical coherence itself is as long as a minute. And this is a, right now at the moment, is by far the best lasers you can build. Yeah? Um, I have a question about the LIGO case. So in, in advanced LIGO, I think people are also trying to do street side, but that seems to be a different noise source from the thermal noise that you're discussing here. Could you comment on that? Yes. The, 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 the LIGO, if you think about the, the noise budget, uh, where the sensitivity is coming from, are, it's mostly, for example, if you, if you put a one watt of light on a photo detector, it will contribute to so-called th uh, short noise, how what the photons are discretized and there will be short noise. Try to go to the, th uh, you can always beat the short noise by using more and more power. The more power you use, just it, it goes exactly as one over square root of n, the, the number I was telling you about. But there's a limit of how many n you can use. If you use too much power, eventually it's going to heat up the mirror. In fact, those mirrors are being pushed by the optical pressure. And so there's a so-called when there's, there's quantum state. It's got, if your measurement is so uh, destructive, uh, and then you're going to destroy that quantum state. So there's a definitely a balance between how much information you're pulling out by using more and more photon numbers, because that scales down. But then there's a so-called quantum limit in terms of uh, the, the system itself is going to be pushed apart by, th by the quantum back action. So there's, a, there's this balance. Going for squeezed light allow you to push that balance, because squeezed light meaning that you don't, uh, by using a finite number of n, so, you, so your quantum back action is limited, but it, because you're doing uh, s squeezing, your noise is scaling better than one of a square root of n, so you can gain measurement precision. And indeed, this is all about the measuring the device that oscillate the, the, the you know, so measuring if, if my interferometer is stayed put and I want to measure the distance between the two mirrors, this is how well you can do by putting how many photons into your system. But if the interferometer itself is doing this, before the gravitational wave hit you, you are always oscillating due to the technical noise of the thermal or the Earth's vibration, then that's your fundamental limit coming from a different aspect. Your oscillator, well, your interferometer itself, is not stable. So the, indeed, there are two different contributions, but it eventually all comes to limit how well you can sensitively measure gravitational waves. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. You can go to lower temperature getting better, that's correct. You can go to 4K, and in fact now, this cavity, we have a cavity like this now sitting in the 4 Kelvin cryostat technology. That's another aspect where the cryo, cryo technology is going to become more and more important, both for quantum information processing and for precision measurements. But you cannot go to, you cannot go to, you can go to hundreds of millikelvin. The issue is whether the, the vibrational temperature, the vibration of the dilution refrigerator is going to start to put technical noise on this. So there's always different trades and so on in your, in your laboratory. Okay, um, so the coherence time that I'll be telling you about, like a minute long optical coherence time, that translates into uh, the distance if you want to talk about coherence length. It's one minute is one eighth of the light takes uh, to travel between sun and earth. So, so the coherence length is actually not spanning nearly one-tenth of the distance between sun and the earth for this laser. And, and um, so 
that's quite not quite enough yet to, to, to tell you why how we can build an optical atomic clock. So far, I told you only one optical frequency, right? So the, I told you one laser that's extremely stable. But how do you get this one laser? How do we count an optical frequency? We don't have, we didn't have that technology 20 years ago. You can have a, a very stable laser, but if nobody can access it, nobody would care about it. And so this this gives you a quick introduction to how the lasers can can allow you to transfer frequency from one place to the other. And so suppose, again, going back to the example of the two mirrors facing each other, forming a standing wave, and you have a one optical frequency is being supported by the pair of mirrors. And here's, the, if you measure the power, it's a constant amplitude. What if you start to put a two optical modes, you know, two different sets of sinusoidal waves that's being supported the cavity, now you can have two optical modes being supported simultaneously, and you will see the amplitude going up and down, because when you have two sinusoidal waves, they will have a beat. And this is what the amplitude of the laser with two modes is going to have, back and forth. It's like hearing, if you hear two different hums of audio frequencies, you can hear a beat signal going up and down, up and down, right? This is just the beats between the two modes. <coughs> what if you have three modes? You can see the beat gets, if the three modes, if the face is controlled, you can see that beat gets sharper and sharper. This is something you have learned. If you have learned optics, you, this is something you know. When you have a grading and you keep having more and more slits, the resolution gets sharper and sharper. This is the same thing, okay? That's, that's, that, that was in the spatial domain. This is in the time domain. Now you have a three modes beating against each other, so the, the interference pattern in the time domain gets sharper and sharper. In the end, we can have, say, 30 modes. And in fact, some of the modern laser technology we have in the lab, you'll have millions of those modes beating on top of each other. And their face is all controlled. So this is really about interference among many, many, many different cavity modes all beating on top of each other. Suddenly, you can see that I'm playing a trick on you. I started telling you about one mode, which is a CW laser, right? It's just constant power with the sinusoidal oscillation. But that sinusoidal oscillation is happening in the optical frequency. You don't have any modern electronics technology to be able to hear the optical wave. But by just by introducing more and more modes into in the same cavity with the same pairs of mirrors uh, here, uh, then you start to have, in the time domain, you start to ha have the pulses coming out. Instead of a CW laser where the power is constant, now you start to have uh, pulse one at a time and, and they are very sharp, focused in the time domain, and this is called a pulse laser technology. Okay, so this is a very simple to understand, yes. Um, and they are face locked, meaning that th this sharpness, of course, only comes when all these modes have exactly the same face, otherwise it will be random. You, know, you, have, you have tons, millions of sinusoidal waves, if they all randomly walk, you will see random noise. But if they are all face locked, you will see very sharp interferences. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you have? I mean, uh, there's an issue of face locking, but setting that aside, yeah. which is really important, automatically you have many modes in this cavity. I mean, the, the cavity. You're talking about longitudinal modes. Yeah, I'm talking about longitudinal so the modes. The cavity allows more, you know, many longitudinal modes to lay simultaneously. Yes, in principle, if depend on your gain medium, some of the gain should be wide enough to have allow you to have many longitudinal modes to be lasing simultaneously. And the the problem is usually in a laser like that, it's very chaotic. They are all lasing independently, so you have to introduce some mechanism to allow them to face lock. This is really into the details of model lock lasers, and I'm not telling you about the details how you introduce that face lock. But if you could do the face lock. That's indeed, uh, this will, you'll automatically have that gain. Okay, you just have to block those modes, but the modes are there automatically. The, the modes are there automatically, yeah. And also, this is, I mean, is a kind of a complementary way of thinking about this picture. It's just the pulse traveling through the cavity, uh, just uh, where you actually have pulses traveling through the cavity? Yeah, so, th so this is, if you think through of this, when you have a millions of modes, or you, uh, here's an example of when you have a 30 modes, this is exactly the, if you want to think of it in the time domain, this is exactly the pulse is traveling through the cavity. And, but, uh, 
But it, really, what's going on is um, this is where people are always confuse. Like we, if we, if the pulse just came through, and you have a, you, somehow you put your photo detector in between the two pulses, you will see I will see nothing. Right, the pulse just went through, and the next pulse just went through. But if you make your photo detector to be very narrow band, or your time response is not fast enough to see individual pulses, then you will, you will capture individual lines of the frequency that's coming through. Both are present. It's just, I think a more fundamental way of thinking about it is you have, a, you have a many, many, many modes all lasing simultaneously, and the pulse is just a, a consequence of their interference in the time domain. That way you know there are all these modes are there. Actually, in fact, you can think of it as thousands of CW lasers. They're all lasing simultaneously with exact phase relationship. Therefore, when, by the time I send my laser to you, you will only receive them in a, in a discrete pattern. But that's because these modes are interfering with each other. Can you just say like, maybe one or two things about how do you decide? Like, let's say you wanted to actually run this thing like continuous wave. Laser. Yeah. What do you do differently from if you wanted to uh, to have all of these multiple phase lock? Yeah, so all you need to do is, as Leo said, is, is to prevent the, uh, the, the all these modes simultaneously available. So what you can do is uh, you can actually put filters inside. The filter has different bandwidth, and so suppose I, you know, you have a 30 modes running with different uh, optical frequencies. If you put in a little piece of glass that has a transmission curves that only select one particular mode. Then only that guy will survive. The rest will all die down. And in fact, the laser is actually a very nonlinear medium. Sometimes, it's just by introducing a little bit of competition, I just need to get you ahead by 1%, then the rest of us, you will dominate all of, all of us. And it, eventually, just one guy dominates on everyone. And so you can, do, you can play games like that to go from CW to the, to the pulse laser. I'm, I'm making it very simplified, uh, but in, in reality, of course, you make specialized lasers for each individual type. But it, mathematically, you know, theoretically, if you want to think about how different forms of laser, this is what all you need to know. And in fact, the reason why I, I'm making an effort to tell you this is because there's another really important piece of technology, which is so-called a frequency comb. Now you can understand where the frequency comb is coming from. It's just a chain of pulses coming. And in the time domain, we all know how to do Fourier transform, right? So if you Fourier transform a train of pulses like that, it will become, uh, in the frequency domain, as discretized lines, where the spacing between these individual frequency comb components in the frequency domain will be given by the, the, the inverse of the pulse period. And the sharper the pulse, individual pulse is, meaning the larger the Fourier bandwidth, in the, in the frequency domain is. So you can see the l shorter the pulse is, the larger the bandwidth this is. So, so everything is really simple. It's just a very simple f first level, first year college level Fourier transform. And th the reason why I'm going through that is because now you understand if I had a one laser that's very, very stable that I was telling you about, suddenly you can cage one of the frequency comb component to be as stable as that laser that I was telling you about that has coherence time of one minute. By doing that, if, as long as I can stabilize the period between these pulses, suddenly the entire spectrum of the electromagnetic wave becomes stabilized. This sounds like a magical, magical thing. Uh, it is magical because it earned these two gentlemen Nobel Prize in uh, 2005, but it's a really very simple concept. But, um, and in fact, throughout my lecture, I'm going to introduce the, the four recent AMO Nobel Prizes, and they are all part of this game, is to maintain a very large number of quantum coherence. And so as the lecture goes, I will introduce where their relative contributions come in. And as you can see, this is sort of the modern frontier of AMO science, why that's so exciting, and why the AMO, why I'm here. You know, I'm not a quantum information scientist, but I'm an AMO scientist. But you're listening to me. That's because we have a connection, I think. <coughs> so, so now we understand the concept of frequency comb. It's much easier to understand that if you have one laser that's extremely stable, through this frequency comb, you can now trans, trans, transfer this phase coherence to the rest of the infrared, to the rest of your visible light and in, even go to the microwave and the infrared, and go to the ultraviolet, and so on. So the entire electromagnetic spectrum cannot be digital, uh, digitally synthesized. 
And this is a, a technology that has never existed before. The, the waveforms of light cannot be digitally synthesized in a phase coherent fashion, just like microwave. That after World War II, we became so good on um, controlling microwave. Now we are getting to be very good at controlling arbitrary waveforms of light. This is something amazing in my mind. And that's really the reason why this frequency comb has been revolutionary. And the reason why it was initially introduced by people such as Ted Hinch and Jan Hall was because when you can count laser frequencies through this reduction gear, remember the reduction gear is that you have this optical frequency now can be connected to this individual spacing between the frequency combs, that's in the microwave. So through this re reduction gear, you can finally count every laser frequency through this microwave technology. And that's the connection that we can no longer think of the, the stable laser as something that very nice tool, but it's difficult to access. Suddenly it becomes every graduate student can access the optical frequencies and use it for some precision measurements in absolute fashion. OK. Quest no questions. I'm going to move on. Uh, this is the very as basic information you needed for knowing a little bit about lasers. Yeah. You can think that way. So if the, as each pulse coming in, if the, the game media can respond to that, in that as fast as that pulse get, comes in, the faster you can respond, meaning you're touching on more and more spectral bandwidth. right? So the data function in time domain is a flat line in the frequency domain. So the faster that game medium can respond to the pulse, the more you can touch, the more and more modes can be coming into play, and the more and more robust the line is going to become shorter and shorter, sh narrower and narrower. But the game medium now is, is it also limited in space, just so you kind of selecting uh, that the pulses are only amplified if they, if they traverse at a, you know. The game medium, if you think about. Well, there's a finite. Uh, there's always some finite distance, and if you want to ca calculate what's the transit time through it, um, <laughs> but the, the tr it's not just the transit time through that gain medium. It's really the non-linearity non when the pulse comes in, the gain actually responds to your to the pulse itself. So it's this non-linear interaction that it's not just the transit time through it. Okay. I guess I'm trying to understand. What, what can you reiterate again? What is the how do you Mode lock. What's the, yeah, what's the mode lock? What's the main root of the mode lock? How do you do the mode lock? Okay, so, so what, if you want to give a one particular example, say you put in um, a switch inside, and, and it's that switch you can control with, with a microwave field. You can turn on the gain to high when the pulse is coming in, and turn the gain down when the pulse is, is, a short, uh, is a passed through. So you can, it's like a shutter. You turn on, suppose you can put in an extremely fast camera shutter in your laser cavity. You can use that as mode locking. So, so because when the pulse coming in, you can o open the shutter and you let the pulse go through. But then you can sh quickly turn off the shutter as quickly as you can to m try to make a pulse it to be extremely short. If you can do that, you are essentially modulating the spectrum according to this, sh this very fast shutter. Usually, that, sh that kind of shutter has a speed limit. And that limits how, how many modes you can do it. So in the end, actually, nature does the best. You actually, actually use the crystal of light. It's, uh, the, 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 the optical crystal itself does this kind of a modulation. But it, I'm using this example of the shutter. You can effectively think of as a shutter that's doing that job for you. Does that make sense? Yeah, so if the light arrives at a wrong time. Yeah, the shutter is not open. So you think that, 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 pul that pulse will be selected out, meaning that that chain is not going to be sustainable. Yeah. OK. Seems like the teacher is asking a lot of questions. Uh, making sure that uh, <laughs> so, so now we are ready to use this fantastic laser, right, to now start to measure these co quantum coherence of the atom. But there is an issue. Um, that's because if you have atoms confined in a, a box like this, now the modern atomic clock is getting to the point it's so precise the atom sitting on the top and the bottom, even if it's 10 centimeters uh, in height difference, you, they would have a different proper time. 
you have learned the general relativity, and the time it on the earth on the surface of the Earth is going to be uh, retarded by the potential of the Earth's gravitational potential. So if the atoms are moving around, there's a second issue, which is, as Einstein said, uh, both the special relativity and the general relativity, that a moving clock is moving is is going slower. So if the atom is moving past you, and you are a stationary observer, then you're going to have to introduce a lot of error in, in how you can measure the time, or how you can measure the quantum coherence. And a lot of these quantum information processing, uh, lots of those noise, especially if it's based on atoms or ions, you, you have to worry about the motional effects. This is exactly where that's coming from. Okay? It's really, if you think about it as a clock, it's very easy to understand a lot of those problems. And, and in fact, that's how Einstein cooked up the relativity, right? Whether it's a special relativity and a general relativity, he always had this thought experiment, Gadakin experiment where the little man carries a clock everywhere. Uh, and that's how he figured it out, all these spatial um, time curvature and so on. So if you carry your time clock with you, you will figure out, yeah, the time is all telling you the different things if you don't control their velocity, if you don't control their height. So you can make a nice clocks but they are all going to spin at a different rate because they are, you have those different time dilation effects. And this, this simple fact was what motivated these three gentlemen. You know, you have heard about them. I, I'm, I, I, I think Steve Chu is actually Energy Secretary in the Obama and the administration. Clark Continuo G. Bell Phillips is our colleague at NIST also. And they invented, um, among many other colleagues who made the contributions, cooling atoms with light. Um, and the basic principle is actually rather simple. You can think of that each atom has these very narrow resonances that I told you about. They can act as a radio station. They can only listen to the light at a specific frequency. So you can actually tune the laser light such that when they, when they move towards you, they will be Doppler shifted into resonance. And so, that, so you, you'll get to absorb photons, always opposing their motion. And that's how you slow them down. And it's actually very effective. If you come to our lab, you can, we can turn on the laser. And the milliseconds later, before you can blink your eye, the atoms have cooled down from room temperature to something on the order of hundreds of nano Kelvin. OK, 10 orders of magnitude of temperature removes in, uh, in the speed, which is um, just a few milliseconds. That's because the photon can provide deceleration mechanism as large as a 10 to the 5G. Okay, so it's an incredibly uh, powerful technique. And this is all because of we want to make sure these atoms are stationary with, with respect to observers. So we can maximize the quantum coherence that we are talking about. So actually, the, take a quick detour of this kind of a quantum technology. Back in 1990s, when the laser cooling was invented, uh, Steve Chu's group in Stanford did the first so-called fountain clock. It's just a fun uh, interesting aspect of learning how people building atomic clocks over the time. So when the atoms are, this idea of fountain clock was proposed in 1950s from a, a researcher at MIT called Zacharias. He said, at the time, again, you're trying to improve the quantum coherence. He said, what's the best way to improve quantum coherence? Is if I have an atom and I just throw it up and let it go up and turn back down by the Earth gravity, during that free flight time, I should have that quantum coherence because I'm not doing anything to it. This was a great idea, except at the time, it was way ahead of its technology because the atoms were so hot, he actually tried to throw them, but they all stuck on the ceiling, and n none of them returned. They were moving too fast. So now, once the laser cooling worked, the atoms are cold enough, you can actually throw them up at a controlled speed. You can put them up a meter per second, which will turn around a around meter. And the, finally, this idea of fountain clock worked. You can put an atom up, and they will come return down, and it, so, so that you can actually traverse through your interaction region of this cavity twice, once going up, the second time coming down, all while the atom is in coherent superposition of ground excited state. So the quantum coherence is maintaining its coherent evolution, and you can, you can ev and this became the standard of building atomic clocks since 1990s, the fountain clock. Um, and it's a really also very interesting. When it was first invented, uh, this fountain clock was first realized in 1989. The accuracy is only 10 to minus 9, actually much worse than existing atomic clocks people were using with a beam. But 
but it's a new technology. So even if it's much worse, the slope is much better. So immediately, two years later, this number was at 10 minus 13 already and surpassed any existing technology at that time. And that, that became the standard of that time. But so you say, well, we can do the same thing, right? I have this strong team atoms, and I can just throw it up in space. And then that, when it returns, it uh, looks like you got a one second long coherence time. Although if you think about 160 second, that actually becomes inc uh, incredible. You would have to throw this kilometers or, or something, right? Uh, so that's not become so practical. But the main problem that's not practical is actually coming from this. If you think about yourself surfing in a very, very calm ocean, probably you was uh, wondering, uh, uh, wondering why you wanted to do that it's, if it has no wind. But, but nevertheless, if you think of a radio wave from is, the, is this vast, peaceful ocean, and you are, you are, you are doing, you're in just enjoying a very peaceful Sunday afternoon, and that's your little atom here, and it's, everything is quiet, and you can measure time extremely precisely. But uh, if you want to measure optical wave, this is a different story altogether. Because now the wavefront is much shorter. The optical wave is sh shorter than the microwave uh, wavelength by a factor of a million. So now you have little atoms here, and you better be sure where you are with respect to the wavefront. Because as you go from the peak of the wave to the bottom of the wave, you will make a huge mistake when you're making a frequency measurement. Um, so you, 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 you have to know where you are. And that's why we do not throw those atoms up and down in the optical clocks because the wavefront is very hard to control. Simply put, the optical wavelength is so much shorter than the microwave, it's very easy for the atom to skip a wavefront. When, when you skip one wave to the next, you make a two pi phase mistake, and can, that, that mistake can be accumulated. So, so now let me tell you a little bit about atomic physics. So we want actually atoms to be completely stationary. And, and now I, I owe you the explanation why we can have a very long coherence time of the strontium atom. I only gave you the fact, but never really explained to you this 160 second coherence time. This is the strontium atom in the, in, that resides in the second column of the periodic table, has two valence electrons. And that when you have two electrons, you can form a so-called spin singlet and a spin triplet. Um, the spin singlet <coughs> has uh, its own transitions, a family of transitions. So is the spin triplet. And in between, the people call it um, intercombination lines, that where the transition is going from spin singlet to spin triplet. Usually, that's forbidden, because the spin statistics would say, if you are singlet, you should not come into the triplet families. But if you have a spin orbital couplings, you can actually introduce that. You can decouple. You can break that coupling. You, you can break that forbidden uh, transition rule and allow you to have some little bit of coupling. And the transition is usually much weaker. But it's actually nice, because this transition is so much weaker, meaning the line width is actually very much narrower. So if you are using laser cooling, the, the photon can find a better landscapes where you can actually slow the atoms or not. So by using narrow line compared to the broad line, 32 megahertz line width, here's the 7 kilohertz line width, you can get a very, very much lower temperatures in laser cooling these atoms. So just by using this particular laser, we can cool atoms down to 200 nanocalvins. This is actually a photo of these atoms being cooled so low to such a low temperature they're sitting at the bottom of this shallow magnetic bottle uh, that's indicated by the dashed line. This is actually very early work when we started to cool strontium atoms down at the time. Um, so that's laser cooling. Now, the transition we actually do, uh, when I told you, advertised for very, very long coherence time is this one, triple P0. And you can see, if, if you have some basic knowledge of atomic physics, you will see that this transition is extremely uh, forbidden, because it's going from j equal to 0 to j equal to 0. And that's typically completely forbidden in the angular momentum selection rules. Um, and so I, then I will explain to you why this transition actually turns out to be possible. And the reason is because in fermionic isotopes, there's a 10 different nuclei, there's a nuclear spin of 9 half. So if you turn up a little magnetic field, you have 10 different nuclear spin states that can be Zeeman shifted away from each other. <coughs> and in principle, the single S0 triple B0 will have exactly the same Zeeman manifold because it, it's dictated by the nuclear spin uh, magnetic moment. However, the triple P0 state can actually ha have an interaction with other upper-lying electronic states, such as triple P1, singleton P1. 
So its wave function is actually a little contaminated by other electronic states, which resulted in the lifetime to be actually possible to be finite instead of many thousands of years. And the manifestation in the laboratory is that the Z-man structure of the triple P0 state is not slightly different from single S0 state. And when Leo was asking me, is that 160 second measured? Well, we didn't measure exactly 160 second at the time. What we actually measured is just measure something really simple. It's called Landau G factor, which is the general ma magnetic factor of any electronic spin or electronic orbit in, in, the, in atomic physics. And it just measures the differential, uh, the difference between the single S0 and the ground, an excited state will tell you exactly the contamination of this wave function is being contaminated by the C1, C2 coefficients of other electronic states. By doing that, once you know what a C1, C2 coefficient is, then you know exactly the lifetime because, because single P1, triple P1 lifetime is, has been measured. And the only thing that's going to give you the lifetime of triple P0 is because of these contaminated wave functions. So from there, just by measuring the Landau G factors, you can determine the lifetime of the triple P0. If you don't have a nuclear spin, theoretical calculation indicates the, the, the decay time will be 10,000 years. Um, so, you know, it will be some isotope changes of nuclear change. So, so it will be very strictly forbidden. Okay, I don't know. Um, so you can actually, like I said, we can actually using lasers to actually measure this Landau G factor simply by just driving these transitions from minus nine half to minus nine half plus nine half, you can have 10 transitions being driven. And the frequency spacing between those tells you exactly the difference between these two levels versus those two levels. So you can measure the Landau G factor. Very simple atomic physics will tell you about this is the kind of the quantum coherence you can have, the coherence time you can have in your system. So now we have almost ready right, to tell you the whole story of the building the clock because we got atoms laser cooled. They are no longer moving anywhere. We kind of understand the atomic structure. So now let's do experiment that we should be able to shine the photon and uh, flip the state, the two level state from a ground state to the excited state. And you can measure the energy difference by just matching the photon energy with the atomic energy. And you do that, the photon goes in, the atom absorbs the photon, goes to the excited from, from ground to the excited state. It gets a little bit of a recoil kick. But the recoil kick turns out to be the problem. And th the reason why it's a problem is Here's the energy level structure of a one or two state, and, and you're trying to use a, match the photon energy with that energy level difference between the two atomic states. Recoil kick meaning this atom is actually moving a little bit with the kinetic energy. That means that the photon you supply to the system will have to be a little bit larger than the actual the energy difference between the two atomic states. And that act little bit larger is something which is experimental uncertainty that we cannot accept. So that means you cannot do that experiment in free space. You actually want these atoms. And th this is, again, a key difference between microwave and optical photon. Optical photon carries a large amount of optical momentum, the moment, re uh, recoil momentum compared to the microwave photons. And, and so if you have atoms actually confined in a configuration like this, and you're excited, if the confinement potential has a bigger force than the recoil, single photon recoil force, then these atoms won't recoil, and you won't have to deal with the recoil energy. This is something that you have learned in Mossbauer effect in condensed matter physics. Even though the mechanism is not exactly Mossbauer effect, but the idea is similar, right? You want to have a confinement force to be stronger than the, the single photon recoil force. The whole thing recoils. Yeah, this, the whole thing can recoil. But actually, the recoil is taken, in our case, is being taken by the entire lattice. So how do we hold atoms with light? Uh, the atom turns out to be something which is uh, very polarizable. And you can turn on uh, very strong laser beams onto the atom and polarize the atom. Just like if you want to pick up a small piece of paper from the ground, you can use a comb, you know, scrub against your hair a little bit, charge it up. And it, it get close to that piece of paper, you can pick up that piece of paper. This is the same thing. The laser beam can actually polarize these atoms and pick them up. Um, except, you know, if you have never done those kind of laser cooling trapping experiments, the, what, what is fascinating is 
For example, I'm using the same laser that we use, people use to cut steel. You can, you can use that laser and it will cut through a steel. You know, I'm not joking at all. Uh, and yet, that laser, if you shine onto this very, very cold atoms, that atoms remains extremely cold and it's not cutting, it's not, you're not splitting those atoms. Um, the, the only reason is because steel, you know, being a piece of a condensed matter material, has a lot of energy bands. And there's places where energy can be absorbed and it will heat up. That's why you can cut it. For atom, for this particular simple atom, two-level system, it's very easy to be tuned off resonance such that it's no energy is being absorbed. And you can actually create a reactive force which allows you to change the spatial dependence of the, of the AC stock shift, the polarizability. And that's where you can create a trapping potential because depending on the spatial geometry of the laser beam, the frequency shift, AC stock shift, now depends on the spatial geometry, and that's where their inhomogeneous trapping potential creates the trapping, creates the, the confinement for these atoms. But the reason why I like to show you this is to just emphasize sometimes it's just a piece of technology you take for granted, but it can do magical things once you understand what's going on. And it's not quite enough yet. You have these atoms holding in the in the, in, the, in, in the optical trap like this. The problem is, is that if I make a measurement, remember, I was trying to make a measurement between ground state and excited state, and if the atom level structure is being distorted like this, and I make a measurement, depending on where the atom is, the frequency is all over the place. So that, that, that clock, is no, nobody will trust it, because it depends on what laser you used, how deep the laser potential is, it's going to have mistakes all over the place. So we came up with the idea where well, we probably want to find a trapping potential where the ground state and excited state have exactly the same distortion, such that regardless of where the atom is in this potential, the measurement energy spacing is always the same, uh, as if this trapping is actually not there. And this is what we call the magical light. Uh, has, uh, uh, if that's true, you can actually then just having a laser beam being reflected by a mirror and form a standing wave, and you can have the places where you have uh, anti-nodes, the atoms are going to be trapped in there. So you can have a stack of pancakes. Each one of those pancakes can have a dozen atoms, you know, 20 atoms. And all together, they form uh, a very precise measurements now. So this goes, maybe, maybe just give you a very, very quick technical uh, notes on how we can pick up this kind of a magical wavelength. If, you remi if I remind you, the energy level structure of a strong team has a singlet and triplets. And you apply weight laser wavelengths to try to polarize these atoms. You can see that this wavelength interacts with the ground state in a very different way with the, this weight laser wavelength interacts with the triple P0 because they're interacting with their own family of uh, spin singlet, spin triplet states. And uh, therefore, you can almost independently tune the polarizability of these two states such that the green, uh, the blue represents the ground state, the red represents the excited state. And you can find the location where the polarizability actually completely match. This is the place where we trap atoms, where, where the two trapping potential of the ground excited state look exactly the same. So, so putting all these pieces together, how, how precisely? Can um, we, can, we can do that with 18 digits now. It's experimentally measured. It's not a, yeah. So we basically can measure. If they are not, the clock frequency will shift. And so we can, we can fine tune it. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> and in fact, that will limit. Uh, uh, tomorrow, I will tell you a little bit about spin over the coupling topological states that can be probed by the clock. This will be the key piece of technology. They allow you to tune the spin orbital couplings and so on. So if I sum everything together, we have a good piece of laser that, has, that allow you to have a good a co optical coherence. The atoms can now be confined in laser cooled in the quantum mechanical ground state so that when you drive the transition from the ground to the electronic states, the external degrees of freedom are now quantized. And you can think of as being driven both internal and external degrees of freedom simultaneously. But if these two potential wells look exactly the same, those quantized states are um, completely matched, then this transition is now decoupled from external degrees of freedom, right? As you drive, this transition looks exactly as if the atom is in free space. But it's better because you have no recoil shift. 
So these are the, all the technologies combining together that allow you to do single particle quantum state engineering. And this is the technology that was pioneered, in fact, by people like Dave Weinland and Serge Haloche, who shared the Nobel Prize in 2012. And what they were able to demonstrate is, in Dave's case, he trapped atoms with not atom, but a, not neutral atom, but an ion. In the ion, it, the picture looks exactly the same. The trapping potential is not through this AC stock shift of the light field, but through the Coulomb, Coulomb force, of the, because the, his particles are charged. So you can just put electrodes up where the internal states are, are completely decoupled from external degrees of freedom. And th there, he could have used just one trapped ions that was able to demonstrate atomic clocks at 10 to minus 17. Dave, for the longest time, in fact, leads the re led the record of atomic clock. And at the same time, he can build up ion-based quantum computer. It's because of that, right? He, his lab was the time, was able to maintain the longest quantum coherence for single trapped ions. Now we finally caught up with neutral atoms. And, uh, and of course, we want to surpass completely, which we have over the last few years, is that the technology allow us to scale up the system. In quantum information processing, also this is a big word, scale up. If we can have many, many atoms in here, we obviously want to take advantage of that because there's a one over square root of n game, even before you talk about entanglement. So this is the place where um, I, th I feel it's very exciting where you can have, using this kind of a basic platform, you can study quantum antibody physics, you can study the, the frontiers of a precision measurements, you can study quantum entanglement, you can study quantum simulations, and so on. And that's the basic ingredients. Um, putting all these ingredients together, this is a, uh, just to summarize where the clock is, and you have ultra-stable laser which resembles uh, this pendulum, and now you can use atoms to make sure these ultra-stable lasers are being fed through the information of the atom itself, so they are uh, identical. Uh, wh wherever you build your ultra-stable lasers, they are being serviced by the atoms. And then you use frequency combs, you can read that information out. So this is a, a complete analogy to a typical clock you will have um, in, your, in your home, except that we are using now modern quantum physics technology to do this. Um, Back in 2008, this reached the stability of uh, accuracy actually better than the, the definition of the time itself. And so now people are very actively discussing the time should it be redefined according to the optical standards. Uh, there are major eff effort going on internationally to now start to discussing what, which atom to use and so on. But rather to, to keep my talk in, on, the, on physics, since time is coming up, I'll give you some teaser of what I experimental physics we can already set new records and set new stringent uh, um, limits on. For example, when the Earth is rotating around the Sun every year, because the orbit around the, uh, of the Earth around the Sun is not orbital, is not a, uh, so, sorry, is not circular. It's rather it's ellipt elliptical. The annual variation of the potential is actually five percent, as you can see from this simple animation here. Um, so if you say, what if the local Lorentz invariance is not valid? Well, it's been valid for, you know, say at the 10 to minus 14 level and, and so on. What if um, the, the, when you drop an egg and a piece of feather on the surface of the moon, they are actually will fall on a different velocity at 10 to minus 15 level? Who has checked that? Nobody, you know, this is something people actually ask questions like that. The, there are obviously things which are not falling under the standard, uh, the, the so-called standard uh, uh, model of physics. There are things which we don't understand. Asymmetry of matter, antimatter, uh, dark matter, things like that. So people are proposing different theories to allow us to, using the modern experimental physics to put constraints on. What if a fundamental constant, like your readable constant or fine structure constant, actually depends on gravitational potential? You would never think of that you know, in the standard model. Uh, but you can always make uh, that, that kind of assumption, and you can, again, put, put your experimental to that test. So this is measuring, for example, the variation of the frequency. Since we have a clock in Tokyo, a clock in Paris, and a clock in Boulder at the time, in 2008, those were the three optical clocks operating internationally, and we can compare them through GPS units. Um, 
and you can so you actually you can see the agreement between those international labs is actually quite good after a few years of work. And then you can say, well, let's assume there's a sinusoidal oscillations due to the fact that every time Earth runs around the sun, the gravitational potential changes by 5%. And if that gravitational potential is affecting the, the fundamental constants like alpha, then the freq clock frequency will change. And, and it, you, as you can see, obviously, it's not changing that, not that, not that much. But now, this was 2008. Uh, 10 years later, we have numbers which are, uh, at the time, 10 to minus 16, we are not 10 to minus 18, we're 100 times better. So those kind of a test is becoming more and more stringent to allow you to rule out certain theories that claim that maybe there are su such couplings. Uh, the, in fact, the latest the set of clocks is now demonstrated with, say, two different independent strontium clocks. You can compare them, and the sensitivity will be at a one second averaging already reaching three times 10 to minus 16, and it goes down to something like a 10 to minus 18 or so. Um, 10 to minus 18 is where the, the gravitational redshift is on, on the level of one centimeters. And this is the current standard of time. So you can see the, the, the new generation of atomic clock based on maximizing quantum coherence indeed is much, many orders of magnitude already better than the current existing clocks. And the, the, it gives a also much better accuracy than what it, we used to have. This is the current generation of atomic clocks based on fountain concept that it gradually I, I briefly introduced it to you. These are the optical atomic clocks, the, the, the progress of this over the last uh, 10 years or so. And the, the latest, just to give you a, kind of a latest uh, work, this is the NIST laboratory. Some of you may have, have visited where they, ha they have ion storage for quantum information processing. They also have uh, atomic clocks based on trapped iron. And we have a fiber connects between Jela and NIST. The, the fiber, we can send our very best lasers, this, this 10 millihertz laser, through this fiber, go over to the NIST. And if you don't do anything to it, that the fiber gives a tremendous amount of noise because there are people walking on Broadway, and the cars driving back and forth. You're squeezing these fibers with all these acoustic noise. So if you put in 10 megahertz laser, by the time it comes out of a nest, it would be one kilohertz wide. And so we actually hear all the noise of the fiber and, and it devised a way to cancel that noise. It's like um, the best experience of both headphones. When you, you go on the airplane, when the airplane bothers you, you put on the headphone, and it, the headphone does is measure the noise of the airplane and puts anti-noise onto your ear to cancel it. And we do exactly that technology. So the, the laser goes through, hears about all the environmental noise, and we give them the anti-noise, such that when they emerge in the nest, the noise cancels. And with this technology, we can, these are the people involved from Jela side and from the NIST side. You can actually now compare these clocks down to the level of 10 to minus 18 between different laboratories. And I, th I think this is a really sort of a landmark experiment in my mind. This is just earlier this year. The paper hasn't even been written yet. But being able to compare clocks out of your lab at 10 to minus 18 level is not an easy task. And just to give you one simple example, to be able to report that number, the first thing we need to do is to invite National Geodetic Survey team. There's a National Geodetic Survey. They, they are geophysics people. They come in and measure the height difference between Jela and NIST. Now, what's the height between here, what, yeah, strontium clock, and a NIST utopium aluminum ion clock. If there's 10 to minus 18 is only one centimeter difference. So if your height is a couple meters, you will never be able to compare clocks at the 10 to minus 18 level. And so they did actually an incredible job. They, they measured the local gravity in our lab. What is a G? And it, what's G at the different heights? And then use a leveling arm to connect from through the stairs from our basement laboratory all the way out to NIST. At ten, uh, this is the best they can do is actually a couple millimeters. And in the future, this, the, 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 that technology runs out of steam. You can no longer measure the geopotential differences. You will have to use clocks to measure the, the geopotential differences. In fact, if you, if you know border geometry now, you know this is the area where the Rocky Mountain starts. And so this, you have a big piece of rock in your backyard. The gravity could be pointing that way also pointing down. 
And so there will be difference depending on how far away you are from border city. The time might be delayed just as if you're lifting clock up in space. So all those kind of physics will come out, in fact, from quantum technology, not from the traditional technique of being able to level the, the surface of the water and how that's stable uh, and, and, and uh, carry that around to di at different places. Um, maybe I will pass this since time is up. Um, so I won't talk about this. But I, I would rather get maybe give a prelude for what I'm going to talk about the second lecture tomorrow. Um, and really, I want to focus on interactions tomorrow. So today is mostly, as, as you can hear from me, is, is about single particle physics, how we are maintaining quantum coherence of single particle physics. But what if we put a lots of particles together, lots of atoms together? They are going to interact, right? So if, we are, the, if they are fermions, you know that the wave function describing identical fermions have to be anti-symmetrized. And so if you have two particles like this coming together, you have to have, to have a negative sign with this respect to exchange of this, these psi 0, psi 1. Uh, and that means when the temperature is extremely low, the possible interaction between these would have to be the so-called P wave interaction. You have heard P wave superconductivity. Uh, and this is where that's coming from. When they, they are fermions, the S wave interaction is not allowed. Um, so you will say, well, that, that's actually the reason why we build our clock based on identical fermions. In fact, that the, the P wave provides angular momentum of a 1 h bar. And that gives rise to, when, the, when you look at the interaction energy between the two particles, besides the C6 of Andrews interactions, now you have this centrifugal barrier between the two atoms, because these two atoms have to rotate around each other, uh, circulating around each other with 1 h by unit of angular momentum. And that's a 35 microkelvin worth of a barrier. If the atoms are cooled down to 100, 200 nanokelvins, then you, that got to be safe, because it looks like the, this volcano crater is protecting the atoms which are rolling around on the plane, and it wouldn't be able to come through. And this is largely true. That's why the fermionic atom works so much better than bosons for building the clock up to this point. But, but now, when your measurement precision goes so much better than, than previously you had, even though these interactions are exceedingly weak, and you, build, you claim to build the very best clock, but if you're not careful, these atoms come in together and interact, you will have, uh, you know, the Pauli exclusion principle says it has to be P wave, but that means the two atoms can just persistently rotating around each other for a long time, and that will cause perturbation. In fact, that's the energy shift that you will be able to measure. But this is just the beginning of how to describe using clock to measure how the atoms actually interact. But turns out this can give rise to an uh, array of really interesting phenomena, whether you study spin half Hamiltonians, or you, you can use that to study spin squeezing entanglements of the, 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 those different rotational, uh, the different uh, spin half systems. You study SU and symmetrical interactions of, because of the nuclear spins. You can study um, uh, spin orbital coupling and explore topological states of matter when the atoms are interacting with each other and so on, all in this platform of using atoms to, to do, uh, to using atomic clocks to probe that. So uh, that's the end of my first lecture. If you have more questions, we can either discuss now or we can also discuss tomorrow at the beginning of the next lecture. Yeah. Uh, can you again explain how do you uh, separate out the motional degrees of freedom from the internal space? Yes. Like you said, you have the same potential for D and D. Yes, exactly. It's the same potential for, uh, let's see if I can get to that point. It's uh, relying on the fact that hopefully this will come back up. Um, so this is the internal degrees of freedom, ground to excited state. Those are electronic states. These are external degrees of freedom. Those are motional states of atoms that confine in the potential. 
if the if these two potentials are not equal to each other, then as you drive g to e, you could potentially because this, this wave function will no longer be completely orthogonal with that wave function, and so on. And you can have as you drive it from ground to the excited state in the internal degrees of freedom, you could be also heating up the crystal, right? You can put in your wave functions into the upper lying emotional states. Of course, there's a still separation of energy separation. So, but um, the more you can make these two potentials to be identical, the more s clean separation you will have between the internal degrees of freedom and external degrees of freedom. But what's, you know, in, quant in kind of a quantum technologies, this is always uh, an interesting aspect. Once you can achieve such a uh, clean separation, then you can also put that control back in. If you say, no, actually what I want is to entangle the internal degrees of freedom with external degrees of freedom. All you need is to drive the transitions, uh, depend on whether the atoms are interacting with each other. You can, you can decide to tune your laser frequency from here to there. And in one drive, you can actually now, in coherence of a position of ground or excited state, or motional zero, or motional one, or motional two. So this is always the thing that, as a physicist, when you can reduce the system to the simplest possible way, and then you can control every aspect of it, then you can al always put it back to the complexity. This is what I'm going to tell you tomorrow, that you can, then you can arbitrarily control how the emotional and the internal degrees of freedom you want to be entangled, and how that entanglement is going to be affected due to the, the at atomic interactions. So that design you will explain tomorrow, how do you design the potential? How do I design the potential? Um, what, which design you want me to tell you? I picked the wavelengths for you today. I, today I showed the designs, the simplest form of design is just having a standing wave being reflected off a mirror. Um, tomorrow I will tell you something more, like a, we can have a three different beams coming in to form a three-dimensional optical lattice crystals. Um, are you asking more? Um, Oh, yes, you can most definitely. Uh, if you don't do anything to it, the potential is always different. Uh, you know, so actually, if you go back th this slide here, here, here's, this shows the polarizability of the ground state and excited state. So if you pick a wavelength, say one micron here, this is a big capital one. If you pick a wavelength here, the two potentials is different. But um, what well, just being different is not useful. Sometimes what people want to be different is when, say, well, this, this trapping is actually uh, is, is a trapping, but the other state is actually zero. You know, you can talk about ground state is being trapped, excited state is actually potential has zero potential. So you can use that to study the condor lattice effect when the, you can put atoms in, in a electronically excited state, and suddenly that feels no trapping potential, it just moves around, interacting with other parts of the atoms, um, and so on. I'm not going to go into that detail tomorrow of a different engineering, different uh, potentials, except when I talk about spin orbital coupling, there will be some discussion of when atoms in the band structure of the lattice, and if you are not, uh, you can introduce phase shift and so on, which will allow you to engineer the band structure a little bit. But on the single particle level, um, at the moment, we are just focusing on doing this. But <coughs> a couple of years ago, actually I wrote a paper with Peter Zoller proposing doing the quantum computer with strontium atoms. There, definitely, we actually engineered different trapping potentials near these crossing points where you can actually have, for example, the excited state go, going through exactly zero somewhere here while the, excite, uh, the ground state is still trapped. And you can, you can engineer in different ways, you can vice versa. So you can actually do cluster uh, entanglements and so on. But, but not, that's not something um, that we are pursuing at the moment in the lab. But, but again, the, the fact that, that's why I think even what's useful is that the, the concept of you have a spin singlet manifold here, you have a spin triplet manifold there, and you have nearly independent control of the polarizability of this atomic state, that atomic state, and that's all you need to remember. Because once you have that, you know that you, once you have that freedom, then you can just design what, whatever you want. In our case, for clock measurements, you want them to be exactly identical. In certain cases of a quantum uh, 
information processing, you want them maybe to be quite different. And these are the things you can just design according to what particular protocol you want to implement. Other questions? Yeah? We don't know. We, right now, we don't yet. We would very much like to. But some of the discussion uh, we can have tomorrow because we haven't exhausted yet how many atoms I can use. Remember that uh, you, somebody asked me about the question about LIGO. And that was an excellent question. Why people are interested in squeeze light? And that's because there's a fundamental limit how much a photon you can put it on. Currently, LIGO uses 1 watt, 10 watt lasers. If you say, well, what if the technology can provide a kilowatt laser and you can shine that into interferometer, certainly your shot noise is going to be lower because you have more photons. But you will have a huge quantum back action. So you are not at this point where, on one hand, the noise is going down with shot noise as a function of number of photons. On the other hand, the quantum back action is going up as a function of number. So there's a compromise somewhere. You pick the best number. At that point, you don't really have a game to play anymore in terms of I just use more uh, photon numbers. The only game you have is squeeze to make sure the photons have correlations. <coughs> right now, we haven't exhausted in the atomic clock. We haven't exhausted that 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 thing. Uh, right now, we are building a three-dimensional optical lattice clock, for example, exactly with the goal that using correl spatial correlations, fermionic statistics, band insulator concept you know, from Kapala to from condensed matter. You can put more and more atoms into your clock system, such that a square root of n will continue to buy you more and more precisions until you run that out. You necess not necessarily need to work on spin squeezing right, right away, although spin squeezing is obviously a very exciting area that we want to get into. OK. If no further questions, we will see you tomorrow. <laughs>